Can you identify what this structure is and what it is used for? The launch appears to be that of a ship, but the structure is quite different. Observe the scale. Those tiny dots you see are people. It even makes the cargo ships seem small. How are bridge foundations constructed, and what is the purpose of this structure? There are several techniques for constructing the foundation of a bridge over water. One of them involves driving piles, which can be made of wood, metal, or precast concrete. For this, vibratory hammers can be used, equipped with a system of counter-rotating weights, driven by hydraulic motors. A variation of this technique is the resonant hammer. The system identifies the natural frequency of the pile, and with a piston cylinder device, pushes and pulls the pile at that same frequency, essentially turning the pile into a spring. It takes less power to drive the pile, and it does with zero ground vibrations. Another commonly used is the impact hammer, which may be pneumatic, hydraulic, or diesel powered. Another technique widely used in constructing the foundations of these massive bridges is the use of cofferdams. These are containment structures that can be of various types, as we will see later. Once positioned, all the internal water is drained, and the mud is removed using pumps, exposing the riverbed or seabed. This allows activities to be carried out as if on land, such as drilling into the soil, inserting steel reinforcements, and performing concrete casting. However, as the depth increases, the pressure difference between the two sides of the wall can become quite significant. As a result, water may start seeping through the soil and into the cofferdam. This phenomenon is known as seepage, is the same process that leads to the failure of many dams. As I sit here and watch, I mean, you see it caving, it's just coming apart. At 11.57 a.m. on June 5, 1976, the Teton Dam collapsed, flooding homes, farms, and the upper Snake River Valley with 80 billion gallons of water. It is governed by Darcy's Law, which depends on the soil's permeability, the pressure difference between the two sides of the wall, which varies with the water depth, and the length of the fluid's flow path through the soil. This length can be increased by constructing a thicker wall, or in the case of cofferdams, by driving their walls deeper into the soil. In some projects, the ideal depth at which the walls should be inserted into the soil makes the project unfeasible. To compensate, constant pumping of the water seeping into the work area is employed. This also helps mitigate the effects of any leaks that may occur at the connections between the walls. In the end, water is pumped back into the structure in a controlled manner, and the containment walls are removed, leaving only the foundation. The design of the cofferdam must be carried out with extreme caution to avoid weak points that could compromise the entire structure, potentially leading to its collapse and flooding an area where workers may be present. However, most internal work is carried out only when the water is calm. Under these conditions, it is easier to identify potential structural failures, which tend to occur more slowly and predictably. Additionally, some emergency water pumps are usually installed on site to extend the evacuation time in the event of a leak. This technique is also used in other water-based projects, such as the construction of large permanent dams and ports. One method of building cofferdams is with earthen or concrete dams. If made of earth, which is permeable, constant water pumping is usually required, and there is also a higher risk of failure. Another approach is using metal sheets driven into the ground with hammers, such as pneumatic ones. These sheets are interconnected, and a sealant is applied along the joints to make them watertight. The walls are also internally reinforced with metal beams. If the soil is too rocky, or the water is too deep to drive the sheets into the ground, an alternative to prevent the structure from moving is to build multiple metal cofferdam cells. These cells are filled with soil materials such as earth, sand, or rocks to ensure they remain anchored. This type of structure is commonly used in construction projects that cover large areas. There are also various other types of cofferdams, including inflatable ones filled with water. However, as the water depth increases, cofferdams become less practical and pose greater safety risks. They need to be larger and more heavily reinforced to withstand the increased water pressure. An increasingly common method is the use of the peculiar structure we saw earlier, known as a caisson. Although they have been used for centuries, recent advancements in construction technologies have made them one of the most modern techniques available today. It is usually made of metal or reinforced concrete, with the top and bottom being either open or closed. However, the top is usually open, it can be constructed on land or through floating docks located near the foundation site. This caisson dock, developed by the company Axiona, holds a world record. It is capable of constructing a reinforced concrete caisson 111 feet tall. The entire process takes place on a vessel, like a giant 3D printer. It's actually more like a floating factory, as the construction is manually carried out by workers. Once completed, the caisson is transported to the construction site. Those with a closed bottom can either be placed on a barge or float on their own, being towed as needed. Despite its weight, the caisson's volume is so large that it floats, much like a concrete ship. 
For caissons with an open bottom, they can also be transported on a barge, or a temporary bottom can be added to allow them to float like the others. Another option is to use auxiliary flotation devices, such as flotation balloons or steel tanks. Like the closed bottom caissons, they are also positioned with the help of tugboats. In the case of closed bottom caissons, the riverbed must be leveled before lowering the structure. This is done using barges to deposit rocky material onto the riverbed. With the caisson in place, its chambers are flooded, and it is sunk to the riverbed or seabed, guided by vessels and cranes to control the descent. Metal structures embedded in the riverbed can also be used to guide the caisson. The descent is the most delicate part of the operation, as there is a risk of the structure becoming unstable and toppling over, or being carried away by the current, causing it to end up in the wrong position. Once in its final position, the caisson is filled with concrete, sand, or rocks to increase its weight and stability. Finally, the bridge pier can be constructed. If the top of the caisson remains submerged or very close to the surface, and it is necessary to build the bridge pier in a dry environment, a temporary cofferdam can be installed on top of it, which will be removed upon completion. Open bottom caissons have a sharp lower edge that facilitates their penetration into the soil under their own weight. High pressure water jets can also be installed at the base of the sidewalls to loosen the soil, making penetration easier. Depending on the required depth, additional sections can be added on top of the caisson, connected through joints at the contact points. These additional sections increase the overall weight, driving the caisson deeper into the soil. Additionally, there are pipes connected to pumps that dredge the mud from the riverbed, allowing the structure to penetrate even deeper into the soil. This can also be achieved using specialized cranes with clamshell buckets. In these open bottom caissons, metal pipes can be driven into the soil, then drilled, reinforced with steel bars, and filled with concrete, forming piles that are connected to the foundation base. Finally, the bottom is sealed with concrete, the internal water is pumped out, and the caisson can be partially or fully filled with reinforced concrete. Unlike cofferdams, the caisson becomes a permanent part of the foundation. This technique has an implementation time of approximately 6 to 7 hours, whereas cofferdams take several days. Additionally, cofferdams are typically used in water depths of up to 60 feet, while caissons can be employed at much greater depths, and in conditions where the lateral forces of the water are significantly stronger. They can also be used, for example, to anchor offshore wind turbines. There are also pneumatic or pressurized caissons. These are bell-shaped structures, closed at the top, that are driven into the soil. However, they are no longer widely used due to safety concerns. Let's take another look at that metal caisson from before. It measures 205 feet in length, 106 in width, and 111.5 feet in height, consisting of three smaller sections. The walls are double-layered for added strength, with a thickness of 6 feet, and are partially filled with concrete. Each of these caissons weighs 3,200 tons. For comparison, a Ford F-150 weighs between 2.1 and 2.5 tons. This means that one caisson is equivalent to the weight of 1,500 pickup trucks. It was built at a shipyard on the riverbank where the bridge was being constructed. The launch, transportation, and positioning took only two hours and 10 minutes to complete. This is an open bottom caisson. For transportation to the site, auxiliary flotation devices were used, and it was positioned with the help of tugboats. It was used to construct the main tower of the Wuxue Yangtze River Bridge in China. This cable-stayed bridge, featuring a harp system, supports a deck with a main span of half a mile. The main tower is 884 feet tall, making it taller than both the Statue of Liberty and the Washington Monument combined. For comparison, the Gordie Howe International Bridge, currently under construction between the United States and Canada, features a main span of 0.53 miles and a height of 722 feet. However, its piers are built on land, Take a look at this other metal caisson, currently the largest in the world, used for another bridge. It's 236 feet tall, showing that these structures can be used at really great depths. Now let's check out one final technique that doesn't require removing water from inside the structure. Remember those piles we saw anchoring the open caisson to the ground? This process is similar. The difference is that the metal pipes extend all the way to the surface, where the pile cap and the bridge pier will be constructed. First, the steel pipes are driven into the ground. Then, the mud inside the pipes and some of the soil beneath them are excavated, often requiring drilling through rocky terrain. The steel reinforcement is then positioned, and the concrete is poured. Since concrete is denser than water, it is not necessary to pump the water out of the pipe. As the concrete is poured, it pushes the mud and water upward. The concrete must be injected directly at the bottom using specialized techniques to prevent turbulence and dilution with water and mud, which would compromise its strength. Since the seabed is drilled, this technique can be applied to any type of soil, including rocky terrain. It also allows for reaching great depths and is one of the most economical methods, which is why it's so widely used today. And that's basically how the foundation of a bridge is built in a river or at sea. Although the concepts are easy to understand, the challenges are immense. Thank you for your company, and until next time.